Hello and welcome to this short video on comparative advantage in which we will build on the last video and have a critique of it. Look at perhaps some of the problems and see if it holds up to muster. Comparative advantage is based on some assumptions and qualifications. I'll list them all here. Firstly, that we live in a simple world with no transportation costs, no price differences, no friction of movement between resources, constant returns to scale, static resources and efficiency, and we don't talk about effects on income distribution either. Now we'll deal with these one at a time. Some of them don't need much explanation, others will require more detail. All right, let's have a look at the simple world first. The idea of comparative advantage is normally just based on two countries and two products. Here we have Britain and France and coffee and melons. But in reality, the world's significantly more complex than this with many more countries, at least 180 countries at the moment, and literally millions of different products. The question is, does this model of a simple world hold up to the reality of a far more complex world. We'll have a look at the evidence in the conclusion. We also assume away all transportation costs, so those transporting those melons between country to country or those coffee beans or whatever doesn't cost anything, but in reality we know that it does. You, know, you cannot get your trains, your boats or your lorries for free. So a more robust theory would require us to have a look at those transportation costs. We've also assumed away any difference in prices. We've sort of assumed that coffee is equal to rice and that it's valued the same in all countries. But again, in reality, people might value coffee more than rice or rice more than coffee. And it might be different in one country from another country. Again, the theory doesn't take this into account, and perhaps it can't. The theory also doesn't try to take into account that the switch of resources is not friction-free. The skills, the, the equipment and the land needed to produce coffee may be very different, probably they are very different, from those needed to produce rice. And that may be even more so when we're talking about moving from agricultural products to manufacturers and from manufacturers to service industry. Again, the theory doesn't take this into account at all. Next, the theory assumes that we have a constant return to scale. Now, what does this mean? Okay, let's have a look at this green line here. This is signifying a constant return to scale. So if we look along this line here, we say that the more resources that we throw at coffee for a production, for example, the production will go up in step with the amount of resources that we throw at it. But in reality, this doesn't happen at all. Just think about it. When you first start to produce a crop of some kind, you're going to tend to put it on the best available land, so you'll have the best yield. As you try to produce more, you will tend to use less viable land, so your yield will decrease. And this is what is shown here. The yield is going down. We are getting diminishing returns to scale here, not constant returns to scale. And that might be true of the service industry, for example. So you have the best people working first, and then as you expand, you may get more and more desperate for workers, and so you start to choose people who are less qualified and therefore less productive. And again, this results in diminishing returns to scale. The theory also assumes that resources are fixed. Let's have a look at this graph. We have here the production possibility frontier to begin with. But as we begin to trade, we start to learn things from people that we're trading with. We get better at production because we have imported technology, we've imported skills. So as we go along, our production possibility frontier should push out because we're getting better at doing things, we're getting more efficient. Another thing that can also push the production possibility frontier outward 
up and to the right, is that as we become open to trade, we are increasing resources. Capital, for instance. Think of China, for example. Literally hundreds of billions of dollars have been imported into China in the form of investment, increasing China's stock of resources, pushing that production possibility frontier further out to the right. If we go to the other side of the globe, for instance, to Europe, Europe has become more open to immigration over the last few years, bringing more cheap labour into the continent pushing the production possibility frontier out, particularly of the low-end um, production things such as agriculture, and perhaps in the healthcare sector as well, in the form of nurses and carers. And the final omission from the theory of comparative advantage is the effect that opening up to trade might have on income distribution. Just because we get GDP growth doesn't mean that everybody benefits from it. In fact, this is becoming more apparent. Some people are doing very well and getting to live in palaces. Others are not doing so well at all and may end up on the street. And this, of course, is a big issue, especially when you're trying to sell the idea of open trade to the population as a whole. Sometimes, as economists, we paint a very rosy picture and conveniently forget about the effects of liberalised trade on some of the weaker members of society. Now, that's not to mean that free trade is a bad thing. It means that we need to take this into account when we're loosening up our trade regimes. So, in conclusion, does this mean that the theory of comparative advantage is actually not very good? Is trade bad for us? Are there too many things that we've assumed away? On the face of it, it might seem so. But let's have a look at the evidence, and there has been plenty of research into this issue. I'll quote two sources, Vatsiak and Welsh, and apologies to Vatsiak if I pronounced his name incorrectly. They found that in the second half of the 20th century at least, countries that liberalised their economies experienced a 1.5% per annum increase in growth over those that chose to keep their economies closed. Now, 1.5% doesn't sound very much, but if you add that up over a few years, it becomes really quite significant. Later on, Frankel and Roma showed that an average of 1% increase in the ratio of international trade to GDP produced a half a percent increase in the incomes of the population. And again, that's not insignificant. The more you open up your economy, the richer the people of the country get. In the next videos, we'll be looking at some more trade theories and how trade theories have developed over the 20th century.